Well, uh, so, so we'll, we'll go ahead and jump in. My name's uh, Eddie Rowan. I am uh, the Director of Personal Philanthropy Programs at DAV. Um, I've actually only been with DAV for a couple of months. I started back in May. Um, so uh, as you can imagine, a lot of this week for me has been um, very interesting and um, a little bit uh, information overload. We're going to hope to not overload you today with information. In fact, our goal is to make sure um, that you leave with a little bit better understanding, um, and then we'll be able to uh, answer questions, as I mentioned. Um, but we're also happy to connect and um, uh, work with each of you on a one-to-one -one basis down the line if you'd like to do that, okay? So uh, our personal philanthropy programs, uh, and other organizations, if you all are uh, involved or, or under, uh, have engaged with other organizations, sometimes they call it individual giving as well. So um, at DAV, we call this our personal philanthropy programs. Um, and we have staff across the country that uh, assist and kind of help uh, with raising funds for the organization. Um, our team uh, is tasked with raising about $24 million or so, if I'm not mistaken, Sunray. Jason's going to correct me on this. Um, uh, so uh, on an annual basis this year, uh, we hope to eclipse that number. We're on a really great, um, uh, really great pace thus far. Um, and so uh, one of the things, or some of the things that we do, as you can see here on the screen, is we can assist with and provide some guidance around making estate gifts or provisions in your will, uh, gifts through stock, uh, donations of real estate, um, uh, sort of what the benefit of making a beneficiary uh, designation would be. Um, of course, cash gifts, uh, those are always uh, pretty self-explanatory. Qualified um, uh, distributions or IRA gifts, um, and then gifts sometimes through foundations. So uh, this is a, a snapshot of our team. Um, uh, I'm the one with the enormous head there on the left. Um, so uh, I'd like to also introduce you to, uh, to Jason Belland, our uh, Assistant National Director of Personal Philanthropy Programs, Jason. Um, and Alex Sweezy is over here as well. Um, if you've ever called into the office, Alex is probably one of the first folks you would talk to. Um, so um, please make sure that you say hello. Uh, you may have also seen or interacted with uh, Suzanne Newell or Charlie Adams, who were here earlier in the week. Um, so hopefully uh, you had a chance to meet and interact with them. Uh, our team is based, as I mentioned, kind of throughout the country, and we're hoping to expand that a little bit. Um, and so we kind of break that up into different uh, geographic regions, and each of uh, the members of our team um, are responsible for uh, basically a portfolio or a group of donors um, to kind of help walk people through and work people, um, uh, help get enga people get engaged with DAV and the organization. So we wanted to provide just a little bit of information around um, some of these types of gifts or giving strategies, as it were. Um, many of you are familiar, at least uh, at a surface level, perhaps, with a will or trust. Um, but we're going to dig in a little bit around some of those. Uh, we're going to talk today about a uh, charitable remainder trust, um, how and why some of the benefits of, of naming beneficiaries um, in your documents, IRAs, etc. Um, and then what are some of the benefits to making a charitable gift annuity and, and why someone might want to structure some giving in that way. Okay. I won't read these to you because there's a lot of, a lot of words uh, on the screen, um, but if you'd like those again, we're happy to, to help, um, which reminds me that we have um, some packets. Each of you should have packets at your, at your uh, uh, chairs as well, um, so that will have some additional information, and you know, we're happy, of course, to answer any questions and work through any of these. So estate gifts. Uh, estate gifts are, are often, uh, you know, also kind of considered planned gifts, estate gifts, right? Everybody should be familiar with um, uh, estates um, at some level. Um, some, some folks, of course, have, a, 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 you know, large estates that they uh, try to liquidate or sort of make beneficiaries and, and things for, um, and others might have a little less. But the, the really, really amazing thing about estate giving is that it allows for um, uh, people that might not feel like they have a ton of assets to be able to make a gift that um, would exceed their ability to give on kind of a monthly basis or an annual basis, things like that, right? So it's a really great way um, for you to structure um, some giving and really have an impact for an organization that you are passionate about. And obviously, you're each passionate about DAV or you wouldn't be here. 
Um, and so our team, uh, as I mentioned, will we'll focus on uh, a lot of times with the state giving. Um, you know, if you're going to leave a portion of your estate to an organization, you tend to have a pretty um, a good relationship with those folks, and, and our, our advisors are, are here to sort of help and assist with that. Hopefully this looks familiar. Uh, I'm not expecting you to be able to read it, of course, but uh, the, the graphics um, uh, hopefully look a little bit familiar. These are uh, articles that we place in the DAV magazine, which each of you uh, should be receiving uh, twice, I'm sorry, every two months. Um, and just to provide a little bit of information about folks who have made provisions or, or um, committed to a, a gift, uh, an estate gift and other things, ways to give. So to try to help uh, break down some of those barriers and, and build some familiarity with the types or structures of gifts. Um, so, you know, continue to be on the lookout for those as well. Our, our simple message is that, you know, we would like for each of you to consider um, and perhaps think about um, making DAV a beneficiary of your estate. Um, and that's something that can be, um, you know, it can get sort of highly complicated. I can tell you um, for the highly complicated things, um, we have some additional uh, resources and folks that can assist us with that. Um, but um, a lot of times, you know, estate giving can also be relatively simple. Um, and so we're going to display a little bit, uh, a tool that can kind of help walk you through that. I know many folks um, tend to struggle with and um, really feel like it's overwhelming. Um, in fact, According to the AARP, only about 60% of people have completed a will or trust or made provisions in an estate. Um, and so, you know, one of the uh, really kind of interesting things to keep in mind around this is that when you, when you name um, an organization or you, you make provisions for family members, et cetera, um, you know, it allows uh, for some less taxable income um, and transference of those assets um, and effectively helps prevent uh, the government from receiving more than you might want them to. So uh, as I mentioned, our, our team is, is focused on uh, estate gifts and, uh, and indiv individual giving or um, uh, what we mentioned here. Uh, estate giving and planned gifts have become a, a very significant, as you can see, a very significant portion of our fundraising strategy at DAV. In 1995, which at least for me doesn't seem like that long ago, um, DAV received a million dollars in estate or planned gifts um, as an organization. And last year we realized over 300, I'm sorry, $31 million in estate gifts. Um, and uh, that was through 311 uh, gifts that were realized during that calendar year. So we've really seen tremendous growth. Again, there's a lot of um, different uh, advantages and strategies um, to kind of help with some of the taxable uh, portion, of course. Uh, but it's also just a really great way to, to leave a legacy for an organization um, you know, that you're passionate about. This year already, uh, we've received um, 190, actually a little bit more than 190 total estates. Um, and we've realized if you saw in uh, one of the presentations the other day, uh, nearly $16 million already in 2024. So again, this continues to be a really um, uh, uh, a good sort of opportunity for people to, to give to the organization. So some uh, kind of uh, in, in the fundraising world, right, um, there are uh, sort of statistics at maybe more of a macro level. Giving USA is an organization that captures a lot of this types of data um, and shares it with uh, professional fundraisers like us. And so we thought we would share this with you. Um, what I'd like to draw your attention to is that contrary to what we might all think around corporations and their amazing generosity, and of course we have some amazing uh, corporate partners as you've seen uh, here this week, um, corporations only account for about 6% of total giving in the United States. It's only about 6%. The other interesting piece of that, it is directly correlated to profitability. Um, so uh, as a corporation is more profitable, they tend to give a little bit more of that away. And when they're not, they tend to give a little bit less away. But it always hovers right around that 6%. It really stays within about a three-point range um, when you go back you know, 40, 50, 60, 80 years. Um, so what that means is that really 75% of giving in the United States comes from individuals in combination from uh, uh, kind of outright gifts, um, but then also from uh, estate gifts or planned gifts. 
Okay. Uh, the, the last portion, as you can see there, is uh, through uh, foundations, particularly um, in uh, family foundations. Um, so right now we're actually in the midst of um, a, a very significant transference of wealth. Um, many baby boomers um, uh, in, in this country, um, a lot of significant wealth when you think of uh, the Gateses and um, others, right, who have been in headlines recently, uh, Warren Buffett and others, um, as they sort of pass along their estates, um, that can really move the target and, and needle. Um, but it's still important to know that, you know, still 75% and even more if you consider family foundations, it's just a different giving wheel or giving opportunity um, is coming from individuals and, and not from corporations. So um, what I'd like to draw your attention to here, it's probably a, a little hard to see, but on the, the top right there, uh, it says 14% um, is of that total, 557 billion this past year is uh, generated from human service organizations like DAV. 24% um, to religion. Um, what's interesting about the, the portion uh, around religion is that it has actually decreased over the past 40 years as a percentage of total giving. Um, and that's partly because of other uh, things that have become more important. Um, for example, uh, environments and animals uh, have really grown over the past 20 to 30 years, whereas prior to that, it really was not um, you know, much, of a, much of a significant portion at all. So here's just uh, kind of a, another way to think about that. Um, you know, as you see, uh, again, looking at uh, human services in 1983, so 40 years ago, um, human services accounted for about 6% of that total giving um, and 63% from religion, right? You see that biggest pie there. And it's, it's changed pretty precipitously uh, over the past four years. Uh, human services, folks like you uh, who are, are giving to uh, organizations like DAV and having an impact. So we wanted to highlight um, this because I think um, it really kind of goes to show the generosity um, and opportunity that people have to, to leave a legacy. Um, uh, this donor, um, Guy, uh, uh, excuse me, Doris and Hector Guy Di Stefano, uh, easy for me to say, um, made the largest gift ever um, via a charitable trust to the charitable trust um, via a planned gift to DAV, thirty-one million dollars. What I want to draw your attention to, though, as you'll see, is um, which tends to be the case in a lot of charitable gifts, is that um, you know their lifetime giving was not you know eighty million dollars or eighteen million dollars; it was eighteen thousand um, dollars. And so, again, this really kind of serves as a good reminder that um, you know there are a lot of folks that we want to build relationships with, um, and we may actually not know a lot about um, their intentions to make uh, DAV a part of their estate in the future. Uh, but certainly made a, a, a tremendous impact on DAV and all of the family and veterans that we serve. Here's some additional information around um, some of the literature and things that we send and share. Um, we're happy, again, to, to send these out, uh, kind of work through some of these things with you on a one-to-one -one basis. Um, but we've got some really great materials that I think are uh, very helpful and beneficial for everyone. When you um, make uh, DAV, a part of your estate, you become what we call a guardian society member. Everybody's maybe heard that term at this point. Uh, that's what that means. Um, and you receive uh, a, a, couple of, uh, a couple of items to help draw some attention. Uh, if any of you had made a DAV um, a part of your estate this week, um, we gave you a sticker to try to help talk and share with other people about why, why you've done that, why that's passionate, uh, why that's been a passion for you. Um, you receive a, a certificate of appreciation that's signed um, by the national adjutant um, and a, a personal note uh, of thanks as well. Okay, let me find my space here. So when you, yes? Um, yeah, I just had a question. I put you guys in the will. So. Thank you. Yeah, by going I did it a couple years ago, but by filling this out and I checked the box, I will let you know I'm in the book because I didn't tell anybody. Yeah. So so that's a really that's a really good point, and thank you for sharing that, and thank you for um, your generosity. Um, a lot of times. Um, 
a, a lot of times, uh, you know, that happens, right? People do that and don't tell us. And, and we'd love to know that so we can, you know, appropriately say, say thank you. Um, but also so that we can make sure that we um, include and, and get, get you information to help you stay and feel connected to the organization and what type of impact um, that your support is giving to DAV. So thank you so much. Um, it's actually not uh, terribly uncommon uh, for that to happen. Um, a, a lot of uh, large estate gifts that we receive, um, uh, more than a significant portion of those are from folks that we didn't know were going to make a gift like that to us, which is, if you think about it, really a tremendous uh, situation. So we would love for you to know. We would love to know so we can say thank you appropriately. So once you take care of um, your loved ones, right, there's some, some things that you might uh, kind of want to think about or consider. Um, the, the most really preferred sort of opportunity for this um, is to make um, uh, your beneficiaries, uh, uh, that being DAV or other organizations, as a percentage of the estate. Um, and, you know, that really helps uh, to kind of clarify things so that, you know, if there are, are gains on a particular asset uh, over the course of time, um, that, you know, there's not questions or uh, family members sort of having conversations around what that extra portion is, et cetera. Um, the most common, however, is that people will give a specific dollar amount, and that's okay as well. Um, but a lot of times what we like to recommend is that people consider uh, making it a percentage um, and divvying those types of things up. That way then as an asset where it continues to grow, it will continue to have a, a lasting impact. I know I'm moving through this kind of quick, but I, we've got a lot of slides. I want to make sure we leave some time at the end as well. Um, so th this graph um, really just uh, shows how much um, passes outside of wills. Um, and really the key takeaway here is that, um, you know, it's important to know if, if your state um, uh, uh, allows for uh, transference of real estate or not. Um, and so we can, again, we can help with that, but about 25 states uh, allow homes to be transferred uh, upon uh, death deeds. Um, so, um, you know, about half, obviously. And, and so, we, you know, we want, want you to, to kind of consider that. So it's important to know that and kind of work through some of that as you're, you're making considerations for things. Um, so really, um, you know, what, what we want you to know about is that with these, all of these kind of factors, uh, it's becoming less and less important, um, you know, uh, because uh, it's, you know, a will can really kind of be a backup plan. They're just, just different things that you kind of work, want to work through. And so it's important to be um, a, a little bit um, ahead of the game around some of that. Some other considerations. Um, if you leave uh, retirement assets to a, a, a non-spouse, so a family member or your kids, uh, those are taxed at a, a considerably different rate uh, than they are to uh, a spouse. Um, and so some of these uh, giving strategies allow for uh, opportunities, uh, in this case the DAV, to receive the full asset and not have to kind of go through taxes. Um, so it can really help um, make sure that you leave a, a larger lasting legacy to an organization um, and then re be able to realize some, some tax benefit um, in uh, that current year and future years as well. Again, we talk about, um, you know, making uh, uh, the priority uh, to, you know, leave the percentages uh, in an estate, you know, uh, as a recommendation rather than a, a specific amount because those, those totals may uh, fluctuate. So this again is 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 talking about uh, you know right making sure that you have everything updated. I think uh, anyone who has completed a will or state things change over the course of time, and so we recommend that people make sure that contact information and their wishes are up to date. Um, and you know w again we're able to kind of help with that. We we encourage people to work with uh, a tax professional or someone. Um, in the industry, um, and we're happy to help make some of those recommendations as well. Um, but um, for retirement plans, it's also important to note that a spouse needs to also sort of co-sign um, on those designations uh, to make sure that that falls within the wishes of uh, the family as well. 
Okay, so there's different ways to do that. Um, you know, investment uh, or financial accounts, obviously bank accounts, life insurance policies. Um, some of you may have picked up over the week, um, there was a, a booklet that we have, and I think there may be some available still in the back, right, um, where people can fill out um, and get you start thinking about some of the different types of accounts and things like that that you might want to start to gather. Uh, as you do that, it tends to make uh, the process a little bit easier as you go along, so not trying to, um, you know, kind of lose track of where all of that type of stuff is. And this is just uh, some, some sample uh, bequest language. Um, as you can see, it can be relatively simple, uh, and Jason's gonna walk you through uh, some strategies around that. Um, and, and again, uh, highlight and uh, illustrate a, a new tool that we've been working with, um, but it can be you know, as simple as uh, something like this. Okay, all right, so I'll turn it over to Jason. Thank you, Eddie. And uh, everyone, as Eddie mentioned, my name is Jason Bellin. I'm the Assistant National Director of our Personal Philanthropy Programs. Um, in October, I'll be celebrating seven years on staff with DAV, um, but have been a professional fundraiser, I guess, my entire career since I graduated from college in, in the year 2000. So um, have been able to use my experience um, in a couple of different nonprofit organizations. I worked for the fraternity that I'm a member of for five years and then was with the American Heart and Stroke Association for 12 years doing um, executive director in Las Vegas as well as major gift officer throughout the country. And so <clears throat> accepting the job at DAV has been uh, the highlight of my professional career. Uh, both of my grandparents were in the military, or both my grandfathers, one in the Army and one in the Navy. Um, grandfather that was in the Navy was probably one of the greatest influences in my life besides my father. And so. Being able to do this in honor of him is an absolute pleasure, and um, like I said, the, the best decision, professional decision that I've ever made. Um, what I want to share with you today is the free tool that we have um, that you can request information on. The, the card that we're going to be using for the raffle, you can select on there that I'd like a philanthropy advisor or gift planning expert to reach out to me to talk through some of our gift planning options. Please feel free to check that box if you'd like or the estate planning kits that Eddie had referenced earlier, we have the ability to send to you that is that record book and lesson book that can assist you with the planning. It's extremely beneficial. Um, for those of you that are Guardian Society members in the room, you can still request one of those because it's good, as Eddie mentioned, to review it on a regular basis. The tool that I wanna talk a little bit uh, with you about today is freewill.com. And the process of going through that, um, Free will will uh, promote the fact that you can create your will in 20 minutes or less. Um, I don't know that I would advise you to do it in 20 minutes or less. It's not a, a race or a contest or anything like that. We have estate planning attorneys in the room that will tell you, um, I'm sure, that it's not good to race through it. It's good to take your time. It's good to think about it. Um, this is obviously important wishes that you are looking to do um, for, again, leaving your legacy with your family. Um, and making sure that they're taken care of and um, maybe a gift to, to DAV or other organizations that you're passionate about. Free will will allow you to do all of that as far as walking you through step by step um, the information that you'll need to gather. And really, as we start rolling through it, it's filling in information to create that last will and testament. And we're going to, I tried to take screenshots of each of the pages so that we'll be able to talk through that and you can see some of the information to gather prior to. So this is the landing page for DAV, dot, or I'm sorry, for freewill.com backslash DAV um, that will get you to get it start getting started with free will. Um, it's not just creating a will at freewill.com. It allows you, of course, to create your last will and testament, a living will or an advanced healthcare directive, um, financial power of attorney, and walks you through a beneficiary plan of um, if, especially if you have a spouse or children or grandchildren, how to go about doing that. You can do all of those here through the portal at Free Will once you create a login and password. It's really as simple as starting to answer the questions that, that they walk you through. Your gender, birthday, phone number, street address that you can put in there. Um, you'll see the save and continue button at the bottom right hand corner of each of the slides usually um, that I have been able to put in here. And that just takes you to the next questions that they're going to be asking of you. Um, walking through marital status, children, 
They even have a section, if you have pets, what you would like to have done with your pets, um, if and when you should pass away um, and you don't have anybody else, or you can outline your wishes for your pets. Um, here it's, we're starting to talk about some of the assets that you have, um, what can transfer within a will, outside of a will, are you working with a financial planner, somebody that might be able to provide advice on particular areas um, of the will. Um, here's some of the information that you'll want to gather um, or, or have with you when going through it. Financial accounts, retirement accounts, life insurance policies if you have them, information about real estate or a vehicle, um, brokerage account, cash or valuables. Some of these, and I think it's the next um, slide. Some of these will have the ability, as Eddie had referenced, to transfer outside of the will, a financial account. Um, can be listed as, uh, you can list a beneficiary, um, and that can be transferred from the bank itself to the beneficiary, not necessarily having to be listed in a will. Um, it's always great, maybe, when you're listing it out, to that it validates what your intentions are, um, but it's also very important to make sure that it's consistent along the way. Last year, we were giving this presentation um, in Atlantic City, and the beneficiary designation that you have listed with your financial institution will override what you might have in your will. A gentleman raised his hand and said, my ex-wife is still listed as the beneficiary of my bank account. He is remarried and his wife is listed in the will. The financial institution will send the money to his ex-wife, not to his current wife. So it is very important that your, it complements what you would like to have happen because there can be that discrepancy um, because maybe it's an account that's 10 years old that you don't really utilize anymore and you name the beneficiary 10 years ago. So it's important that that's consistent. Um, help your executor providing additional information. It, when you click the add a financial account, it'll walk you through putting the account description maybe Bank of America and the last four digits of the account number, the approximate current value of that account, it's going to be totaling this all up for you and then listing those um, on the next page when you click save and continue, it will actually list out assets distributed through your will and then assets distributed outside of your will. That's where you want some of the account information or the accounts to be matching up with what you actually have as the beneficiary designation form. Again, in the bottom right-hand corner, save and continue. Um, and you can go in and out of this as frequently as you would like. So you don't have to do it all in one sitting. Yes, sir. Now, if you, did, if you distribute your um, asset outside of your will, say, for instance, like you said, put them in the beneficiary, will the state and the federal, the federal government still tax them, even though they own that account? Or would it... Or would that just transfer directly over without, in, without this federal and state tax? No, and Michael, please correct me if I'm wrong. You're, the individual will most likely have to claim a portion of that as income um, and then taxed accordingly based upon the state. Um, there are certain, um, would maybe say, estate planning materials, for instance, if it were to be transferred inside of a trust, it might be different than transferred through a will. Um, especially with real estate and the step-up basis that sometimes gets applied. But if, it, if you're looking for just a... I'm saying just like a bank account, mm -hmm. and you put, that, you put that person's name on it. You already paid taxes on that money, so why should they, you have to pay taxes if you're giving it again to your child? If their name is already on that account, it should go free and clear. That's why I'm just, I'm just getting clarification. In my mind, it should go free and clear because you already paid taxes on it. It's in that account. But I know how the government works, so I'm just asking, <laughs> can, can, you, can you get around and put a name as a bit of, uh, you know, on your account so it won't be taxed? Do, do you, can you provide some expert uh, guidance, Michael? Well, I mean, we're clearly not here to give tax advice, but I can yeah. suggest that if you've already got somebody else's name on the account, that they're already a co-owner, so it won't be a taxable event. However, if they're not on it, then it's a pay on death or it's passed through a will or a trust, then it would be a taxable event if it's going to be considered part of the estate or maybe they're going to go into the Of course. 
And please raise your hand uh, as we're going along, and we'd be happy to answer questions. Yes, sir. <laughs> Maybe Mike, doesn't that also put your, his spouse or whoever that is in another a tax factor or income coming into them? So the government looks at that and then they say, okay, this is money that is coming to you. So we're going to tax that individual, not you as the individual that put it in. How is that? Well, it's likely, I mean, outside of probably one state, if it's a spouse, it's going to be a non taxable event because it's already going to be community property. Oh, this is only in the event it goes to someone other than your spouse or like a non-charitable entity. Is that helpful, sir? No, no. Okay, okay. That. Yep. That yep. You know, how that also goes. Absolutely. Of course. But, oh, I'm sorry. Sure. Um, once everything is completed, uh, sure. What happens once everything is completed? How did, does DAV get this information? Um, so the the back end of the website is what the free will calls a portal. So um, as you get towards the end of the will and completing it, there's a portion that will ask you: Do you want to let the organization know that you've left them a gift, or do you want to remain anonymous? So the donor's intention, wh whatever they choose. Yes, they, if they say yes, let them know, then it, it goes into the portal and we'll get the person's name, their address, the approximate value of the gift, um, their birth date so we can wish them a happy birthday, all of the information that they fill out into the will. Um, and then we record that into our CRM add them as a Guardian Society member and then send them some of the welcome materials. So we, we are notified if the donor themselves intends for us to be notified. Otherwise, they remain anonymous. Um, at that time, unfortunately, we don't have the ability to really steward the gift because it just says anonymous. It doesn't provide an address. It doesn't provide um, any other identifiable information for them. Um, along the way, it will start to calculate and give you an estimate of your estate is valued at 200 to 500, 500 to a million, um, all of those. It, it's not necessarily particularly relevant. You can add up all of your assets and, and say, okay, it's $500,000 and really select any one of them that you want at that point. Um, as you can see, this is another uh, on the slide, you can see across the top um, it, it kind of keeps track of it for you of this is where you're at and this is what some of the, the sections or how many more sections you have to complete. So if you would like to leave a gift to DAV, it's in there, you can click yes. You can also choose another nonprofit organization that you might be passionate about and be able to list those out there. Um, as Eddie had referenced, you can leave a percentage of an estate or you can select a fixed cash amount there on the right of, hey, I want to leave $10,000, I want to leave $5,000, whatever that might be. Um, you can write a message to DAV or the other organization that you would like. That does populate into the portal as well. Um, this is where you can select some primary beneficiary of any residual um, assets. Um, any specific gifts that you might like to leave. You have um, some jewelry, you have um, a family painting, other heirlooms that you want to pass down. All you would do at the bottom is select, um, continue, or click to add property, and you can list out as many things as you want. In the last will and testament, it will provide that list for you um, there as well. There's no limit to the amount of information that you can put into there. Um, you have the ability to outline your funeral wishes um, that will be put into the last will and testament as well. Um, you can select the um, executor, w what would you, uh, your wishes for your um, funeral services, um, wh where you want your wishes or your final resting place to be, if that's already been arranged, you can outline all of that there as well. Um, listing the executors, um, the, you, you fill in their name and, um, and then select the, their relationship to you. Um, and you can add a couple of different people in case one maybe unfortunately passes away prior to you. There's others that are listed there. Um, digital executors, 
Um, a no contest clause or all other things that can be added into there um, that are beneficial to, to review and make sure that you have all of that if you've got, whether it's cryptocurrency or other things, um, or being able to sign things digitally or access those digital accounts. Um, do you want to add a self-proving affidavit to your will or um, independent administration, be able to be administered outside of the court system? Selecting yes on some of those is important. You can add a personal statement uh, at the conclusion of the will. If there's anything that you would like to outline to your family or anything like that, you can write that statement in there. And then at, at this point, you're really getting to start reviewing all of the information that you've gathered. So each section um, will be outlined. This starts with the basic information from the beginning, and then you scroll down. I couldn't get the full clip in there, but um, you can edit any information that you might want to change, but that'll give you everything because once you hit save and continue here, it's going to give you the option to download your will or email yourself your will so that you have a digital copy as well. So it is saved in your portal with your login information that's created at the beginning, but you'll be able to email yourself a copy, email it um, to save it in your Outlook or on your computer, anything like that. And then once you hit that button of email it to you or download it, there's your last will and testament. Um, it's generally around 20 pages or so, that's a few check or a checklist of other things to do. Um, when we click here, keeping it in a safe place, making sure you update it on a regular basis. Um, Michael had a great recommendation, um, something that you can grab and go. If the house is on fire, they have fireproof bags now. You don't need a full on safe or anything that might be difficult to find. Um, it, it's, it's much better than it being in a PO box or in a safety deposit box because you pass away, somebody, the executor might not have access to your safety deposit box. It just adds another element. Um, it'll also provide recommendations of printing out additional copies, making sure that the executor has a copy, but not the original that's signed, all of those different types of things. You'll get reminders from free will as well of making sure, have you got your will notarized? Have you, is it witnessed in the particular state that you live in? Some require two witnesses, some require three. It all depends on what that is, but based upon the state that you select um, in the will, it'll let you know exactly what those provisions are. Michael, did you have something? So, caveat to the copies, some states still require an original. Uh, I practice in California, so they prefer an original, but you can have copies if you can't produce the original. So, I always encourage my clients to give the executive, uh, the executor and the trust the, uh the copies mm -hmm. so they have the latest version, so if something were to happen, uh, they can produce the documents for the court. Yep, absolutely. Great record. Yes, sir. Yeah, wouldn't um, the document that these loans are notarized have not been said original? Original signatures. But I'm saying, if the loans are just original signature and the note has each copy, you print a, a, a three, four copies, each copy is signed, originally signed and notarized. Isn't that all those not considered originals? Well, as long as they have an original signature, you can make additional copies. Yeah. Yeah. Copies of the document with original signatures and they each have their own notary stamp. But if you're paying for your notary at 15 bucks a signature, you get the price. Well, most of my institutions will do that for you. A lot of those. Yeah, a lot. Big banks use it. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. This is a web-based tool, correct? Yes, it is. And, uh, it uh, requests a lot of confidential information, and this is an organization outside of DAB. Is that also correct? It is. That is correct. Um, oh, go ask your question, and I can provide it. How secure is it? Uh, have you investigated the security of the system and where the information is stored? Because I assume it's stored at their end on a server somewhere, and you could download a copy, as you said. Um, we, we, can, uh, we cannot access, but the individual can access it, yes. Um, they, free will itself has been vetted by our procurement team, our legal department, the contracts that we have with them, outline the security measures that they take to pr protect all of the information. When the information is put into the system, it is encrypted. Um, so while you can ultimately print out and see your social security number, um, it, it's protected within their system, yes. You're welcome. 
Um, so that really walks through the, the process of utilizing free will. See, we, we didn't really even talk about it in 20 minutes. Um, so again, no reason to try to knock it out in 20 minutes because again, this is your information and you wanna make sure that it's all there. Um, but gathering that information. Um, the other thing that we have the ability to do uh, is uh, talk through it with you on the phone. Um, I've done that on several occasions with donors um, to be able to say, okay, this is the next page that you're gonna be going and listing out the information. I've also, I flew out to um, Redford, Redmond, Oregon um, to meet with a couple that was planning on leaving everything that they had to DAV because they didn't have any children. And so flew out, met with them at their home for two and a half hours or so, got their estate plan completely set up. And the sense of relief that um, the, the wife had knowing that everything that they, they wanted to accomplish was complete. They had their last will and testaments all sorted out. Um, it, it can be a, a very good sense of, or a very big sense of relief. So we wanna assist you in any way that we can to be able to make that happen. A few other ways that uh, individuals can give during their lifetimes, um, and we had a couple of questions about this earlier, so I'm excited to, to walk through it, and that is the DAV Charitable Service Trust uh, Charitable Gift Annuity um, Program. This is a gift to DAV in someone's lifetime that provides the donor themselves with income for the remainder of their lifetime. So the payouts back to the donor are based upon, one, the, the amount of money that's initially donated to the Charitable Service Trust, but really the donor's age, if it's a single life policy, or the donor's age is if it's a double life policy. So if both donors are over the age of 60, then the calculation of the payout rate is based upon uh, both of their ages, not just one. Um, but if one donor is significantly older than the other, we'll use an example of 82 years old and 62 years old, then the payout or the percentage will be considerably lower than if just going off of the 82 year old's age. So it factors into both because they're going to be receiving, or once one person passes away, the other will be receiving payments for the remainder of their lifetime as well. Um, it can be funded with cash or publicly traded stock. Um, and, and then, as I said, the donors, the minimum ages are 60. You can do a um, deferred gift annuity um, if somebody's younger than that, but neither will start getting paid until the donors reach a certain age, but it will pay out at a higher percentage rate um, for them. This illustrates it a little bit, um, and we have the ability to provide a customized illustration to donors based upon their ages. Um, Alex manages this program on behalf of the Charitable Service Trust and creates those illustrations by putting all of the information into a system, and then it spits out the illustration and we can mail that to you to be able to walk through exactly what that would look like. But giving funding the charitable gift annuity, uh, number two, payments back to the donor for the remainder of their lifetime, a portion of those are taxed, especially after the annuity has been funded for a significant period of time. But then when the donor passes away, um, the remainder is then transferred to DAB's Charitable Service Trust. Here's some different funding amounts um, and the payout rate, but one that I really was excited to show you is a donor that we worked with earlier this year, um, and she is in the state of New York. Uh, she wanted to make a million dollar gift to the Charitable Service Trust. We got a little bit creative in how it was going to be funded um, because the second annuitant she wanted to have them share some of the tax burden other, so that she wasn't paying the taxes um, on all of it together. So with this illustration, what we actually did was funded two different charitable gift annuities, both for $500,000 a piece, so ultimately a million dollar gift to DAV. She got a charitable deduction in each one of them of $251,000, and we're going to be paying both of them $48,000 each. Um, for the remainder of their lifetime. You can see up at the top, their ages are 89 and 92. So the money for her um, was just sitting in a high yield savings account, rating, or about 5.1, 5.2%. By funding a charitable gift annuity, they're getting a payout rate of 9.7%. So essentially $97,000 a year versus the $52,000 a year that she would have been receiving on that million dollars. And so not only did it include then the charitable deduction that she got um, for both of those gifts, but then again, we're paying them for the remainder of their lifetimes. And so um, it, it provided a much higher rate. They received a significant charitable deduction 
and they're not paying their the tax free portion of the $48,000 is $35,000. So technically they're only paying taxes on $12,000 for the first couple of years. So with the American Council on Gift Annuities continuing to increase the rates, this is going to be something that is going to continue to be advantageous for donors with getting the charitable deduction in addition to um, getting payments for the remainder of their lifetime. And at this point, I'm gonna turn it back over to Eddie for our last couple of slides before we really get into questions, but thank you for your time. Thanks, Jason. I'll try to uh, keep us moving here. Um, many people, actually uh, many wealthy Americans as well, really do not understand and appreciate uh, the advantages of giving stock. Um, so assets uh, can be transferred to a charity uh, directly. Uh, they're not able to be sold first in, that partic in this particular example. Um, but the, the, the ability for that, though, means that the donor avoids all capital gains and is you know, thus able to achieve a significantly higher gift. Uh, DAV, uh, in, in our case, would benefit from the full value when the stock is sold um, because DAV is a tax-exempt organization. Um, and so ultimately, this uh, serves as a win-win for both the donor uh, and the organization. So uh, IRA rollover gifts um, are, are also a, a, you know, becoming a more and more popular um, opportunity for people to give. Um, uh, these are also considered uh, qualified charitable distributions or QCDs. Um, and and you know, as I mentioned, they're becoming more and more popular um, uh, to help donor meet their I IRA uh, required minimum distributions um, once they reach the age of 72. And there's some different categories around when uh, that happens. Um, but one of the biggest advantages for qualified charitable distribution um, is to provide the ability for taxpayers to lower their adjustable gross income. So donors can transfer up to $105,000, excuse me, per year uh, to DAV um, within their IRA without incurring any ordinary taxes, income taxes. DAV benefits from the full IRA transfer amount as DAV is tax exempt, as I mentioned. Um, and they pay, we pay no taxes when uh, that asset is liquidated. And because uh, adjusted gross income is used for many of the tax calculations, what uh, one of the gentlemen uh, mentioned before, having a lower number uh, can really allow the donor to stay in to a lower, ta lower tax bracket, reduce or uh, eliminate, um, elim eliminate excuse me, um, taxable for Social Security or other incomes uh, that they may be receiving and remain eligible for deductions and credits that might be lost if the taxpayer had to declare an RMD as a taxable income, excuse me, as, as income. Uh, any additional IRA owner or beneficiary who is at least 70 and a half years old can also use the QCD uh, rule to exempt their required minimum distributions. A lot of big words there. Um, Legacy IRA Act, a, Act uh, changes um, were enacted uh, in December of 2022. Uh, there are a few kind of key things uh, to keep in mind here. Uh, a couple of these are uh, repetitive is what I just mentioned. Uh, but the change allows um, for an expand IRA charitable rollover. Um, and that change allows seniors starting at 70 and a half years old to contribute up to $53,000 from their traditional IRA to charities that can fund a charitable gift annuity, as Jason mentioned. Um, a required minimum distribution, as, as we mentioned before, is the minimum amount that individuals have to withdraw um, from their IRA or retirement plans um, once they reach the age of 72. Um, but beginning in 2023, uh, this was actually raised to the age of uh, 73. So um, in nine years, uh, the starting age is going to uh, be increased to 75 years of age. Um, and so this means that if you turn uh, 72 in or after 2023, you can delay your RMD another year, uh, allowing the funds in these accounts to grow tax-free for a longer amount of time. Okay. So additional questions. Yes. If I leave a car collection worth $100,000 for the DAV, what will they do with it? Will they auction it off and put the money in there? Or yeah. Assets? Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, DAV participates in a, a, a 
automobile donation program uh, with cars. Um, they were a vendor in the exhibit hall and we could coordinate with them um, for the pickup of the automobiles um, and then make sure that they get to the right auction as well um, as far as um, they're probably not gonna go to just uh, a normal who's gonna buy them today or go for resale parts or anything like that, but we'll do everything we can to get the highest value um, of, or to maximize that gift to DAV as opposed to just doing, um, I guess, the bare minimum. Um, they have different auctioneer auctions that they utilize based upon whether the car is just gonna get sold for parts or if it is a collectible car. Um, I think one of our largest uh, vehicle donations, I think was right around $67,000 when the program started, um, gosh, about a year after I got to DAV, so probably more than six years ago. And that's continued to grow on an annual basis. Last year, it brought in a little over $4.2 million um, for DAV, I think. So we also have a real estate donation program too. Um, if anybody wants to donate um, a house that they no longer have or a rental property that really is just exhausting um, from a time standpoint, um, that can be don something that can be donated. Um, I will make the, the preface that unfortunately we don't accept timeshares. Um, they're just too difficult with all the maintenance fees and everything like that included. And another thing which technically is a piece of real estate is uh, burial plots or cemetery spots. We, we aren't able to accept those either. Mm -hmm. you no, know, so our legal department will work with a real estate agent in that particular area, whether we determine whether or not we need to set up an estate sale, um, depending on if they are still in the home when they pass away, or if they sell the home at some point and move to an assisted living facility, then the, the proceeds of whatever they have remaining after paying for the assisted living facility will go to the accounts that they had designated to, for DAV to be the beneficiaries of. So it, it could get at, at times maybe a little bit complicated, but our legal team will work with a real estate professional in a particular area to be able to sell the house for maximum value, um, liquidate the assets in, inside if it's through an estate sale or some other way, or in some situations sell the house as is, and the new owner gets to decide what they would like to do with everything. Yep, absolutely. Other questions? Well, we answered all of the questions. Yeah. So you had some final desk, uh, disposition instructions in there. You should probably add something in there if they're not already registered with like the National Cemetery Association or their state uh, veteran uh, funeral services where they can pre-register because I know all my clients, I get them pre-registered so that's not an issue for whoever takes over that they can take care of. All yeah, that's great. And, and just make the contact rather than the register after the fact. Very recommendation. Yeah. And with the will, do they let you know if there's been an update to the law that you should go in and make an update to your will at the same time? No. Uh, is there I would have to double check uh, on free will if there's been an update to a law um, and whether or not they need to make a, an update to the will. Um, if somebody goes in and changes the will, we do get a notification. So for instance, we might've been getting $1,000. They've gone in and changed it to $10,000. We'll get notified of that. We'll also get notified if they've changed their mind and DAV is no longer in their will. Um, but if a law changes, I don't know that we necessarily, or, or the donor themselves or the person who has created free will um, or utilized the tool gets a notification that they need something to be updated. Um, our other gift planning website, davplanmygift.org, gets updated based upon changes in the law, whether it's the Legacy Act that Eddie mentioned and the maximum distribution goes from 100,000 to 105, um, based upon some of those increments, that gets updated. But I don't know if anything in their will necessarily does. Yes, sir. Yeah, as a donor, uh, I could specify a certain program within DAV I want to. Now, does that list any of the programs I could donate to? Um, within free will itself, it doesn't. Um, so you would need to put that in the description of what you're, you would like your gift to be utilized for. So um, for instance, if somebody were to put in there, uh, we see it quite often, um, service animals for veterans. Um, DAV would then have to um, most likely work with our charitable service trust to um, 
execute the donor's wishes because DAV itself doesn't provide um, money for or pro funding for service animals, but our charitable so trust does on a regular basis. Could, were they a veteran that would benefited from the transportation network? They can certainly say, hey, I wanted to go to DAV and help fund the transportation network, and those gifts will um, be honored to the donor's intention. Yes, sir. So, but this probably more to you. Would it be more advantageous to put contingencies into the, the program or into the bill itself that will truly affect and address a lot of changes so that the bill doesn't have to be amended or automatically be amended based on those contingencies? That's, that's particular and specific, specified to the law changes in law. Well, I mean, how are you going to predict what laws are going to be changed and what they're going to be changed to? Okay. But what I'm saying, like in some cases, like in the case of, say, the maximum donation has changed. Then they, you can think about a contingency that says that allows the automatic updates based on that contingency because it's big problems. The, um, most likely that it, it would, those laws for the maximum gift are something that a donor is doing in their lifetime. That gift wouldn't necessarily be made after they passed away. Um, from my understanding. So if we're talking about the maximum gift from a qualified charitable distribution of $105,000, the donor has to make that intention every year. They would, once they pass away, the beneficiary of that particular account would then be the one determining what they would want to do with it um, based upon that. So, or yeah, it's their money now. The, the donor themselves has to reinitiate that gift on an annual basis anyways, as of right now, or decide where they want it to go to 10 different charities. The donor that we work with in New York every year gives her maximum IRA distribution of $100,000 each year. So she has to initiate that through Charles Schwab. Anything else? I, I guess the final questions are, who's gonna win the two gift cards, right? Okay, that's what we're all waiting around for. I, it, just joking. Um, we appreciate everyone's time and joining us today.